Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's CMS Web Interface Support Call. During this webinar, CMS will provide an overview of 2019 CMS Web Interface quality reporting for MIPS groups and ACOs. And after the webinar, CMS will take as many questions as time allows. So now I'll turn it over to Lisa Marie Gomez from CMS to begin. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us today as ACOs, MIPS groups, and virtual groups prepare to report quality data reporting via the CMS web interface. Um, I am, as you all know, I am with CMS and I'm a subject matter expert regarding the CMS web interface. Joining me on today's call are other CMS subject matter experts and contractors who will share helpful information regarding quality data reporting through the CMS web interface and will answer your questions during the question and answer portion of today's presentation. I just want to note that today's call is focused on quality reporting, so if you have any questions regarding promoting interoperability, improvement activities, MIPS, or other general questions regarding quality reporting, you can contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center. Next slide, please. Before we begin, before we begin today's presentation, we will just note that the information presented in today's presentation is current at the time of its publication. Medicare policies change frequently. We encourage you to review and use the source documents and links that are provided throughout the presentation. And please stay tuned for any communication from the Quality Payment Program, Medicare Shared Savings Program, or the Next Generation ACO model regarding any updated information. Next slide, please. As you all know, the submission period for the CMS web interface aligns with other submission types for the 2019 performance year, which opened on January 2nd, 2020, and will close at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on March 31st, 2020. Once the submission period closes, the CMS web interface will automatically accept your submission. As a reminder, the CMS web interface is accessible using the sign-in link on the Quality Payment Program website. Next slide, please. As you know, today is part of the series of CMS Web Interface support calls held weekly through the data submission period. The next support call will be held next Wednesday, January 29th, 2020, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Topics will include um, high priority and end-to-end -end bonus points, frequently asked measure questions covering the following measures, Tier 2, MH1, PREV 5, PREV 6, PREV 12, and PREV 13. Additional topics will be added prior to the support calls if we need to add any. Next slide, please. The other CMS approved approve reason skip request must be submitted through the CMS web interface. This is a way to skip a patient attributed to a measure during denominator confirmation. The CMS approved reason is reserved for circumstances that are unique, unusual, and not covered by any of the denominator exclusions or denominator exceptions identified in the measure specifications. Patients for whom a CMS approved reason is selected will be skipped and another patient must be reported in their place for the measure if available. Next slide, please. The 2019 CMS Web Interface API is available all year for testing in the developer preview environment. You can review the resources listed on this slide for more information. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn the presentation to Kara to discuss assignment and sampling FAQs. Kara? Thank you. A common question is what if pre-populated demographic information is not correct? While it is not anticipated that ACOs, MITS groups, or virtual groups will have a need to modify the pre-populated demographic information, it is an option. If the beneficiary's demographic information in your records and in the CMS web interface does not match, then the CMS web interface user may need to correct the information. For example, Medicare claims may not have the accurate date of birth for a beneficiary, in which case the web interface user should correct this information because it may affect that beneficiary's denominator eligibility for certain measures. 
Note that any such updates do not get reported back to the Medicare Beneficiary Enrollment Database. So you, you should encourage your patient to contact the Social Security Administration directly to update their demographic information. Thank you. You can proceed to the next slide. Next, we have Lisa Marie Gomez for an update on PREV-12. Thank you, Kara. So now, um, as Kara noted, I'm going to discuss PREV-12 scoring updates. So next slide, please. Okay, so during last week's support call, we indicated that CMS is changing how the PREV-12 measure, specifically the pre prevention, care, and screening, screening for depression follow-up measure is scored. Right now, I'm going to go over the scoring changes again to ensure that all ACOs and groups reporting via the CMS web interface are aware of the scoring changes. For the 2019 performance year, the following will apply. For the Medicare Shared Savings Program and the Next Gen Generation ACO model, we are changing the measure from pay for performance to pay for reporting. And for purpose of MIPS, the measure will be excluded from scoring. It should be noted that ACOs and groups will still need to meet reporting requirements for PREV-12, even though the measure has been changed to pay for reporting for the Medicare Shared Savings Program and the Next Generation HCO model. And for purposes of MIPS, excluded from scoring. Also, I would like to note that for the purpose of Performance Year 2019, CMS, CMS Web Interface reporting, CMS will accept any of the follow-up plan actions previously allowed in the 2018 measure specifications, including repeat screening after initial positive screen. Um, next slide, please. Now I will turn the presentation to Angie Stevenson. Hi everyone, this is Angie. Um, we have some frequently asked questions we'd like to share with you um, that are received at the QPP Service Center. Um, the first, uh, next slide please. Make sure you're there, okay. Um, it's for the DM2 measure and the question is, if we have a lab result that shows a collection date and a result date, uh, for example, the collection date is maybe November 1st and the result is November 5th. Which date would we use to report the result in order for the measure to be compliant? Based on the measure specifications, it's appropriate to provide the date the blood was drawn as your first choice. Um, you would use the following priority ranking, lab report draw date, lab report date, flow sheet documentation, practitioner notes, and then other documentation. And this is detailed out in the measure specifications for you. Next slide, please. This question is for hypertension controlling high blood pressure. Are the blood pressure readings from an inpatient setting, emergency department, or urgent care acceptable? Yes, although the measure is intended to be outpatient, Blood pressure readings from any clinical setting are acceptable when reporting the numerator. It would be appropriate to move to the next most recent blood pressure if the most recent blood pressure from an inpatient setting, ED, or urgent care is not within normal perimeters. Question two is, does the blood pressure reading have to be from the most recent visit in the measurement year? Uh, the answer to that is no. Performance is based on the most recent blood pressure documented in the patient's medical record during the measurement year. So the most recent blood pressure may or may not be found within the most recent visit. Next slide, please. This is, these are questions for the PREV-7 influenza immunization measure. Uh, question one, the code 90689 for the IIV4 influenza virus vaccine for intramuscular use code was new 
October 1st, 2018, and is not included in the 2019 PREV coding document. Is this vaccine acceptable to meet the measure? Um, IIV4 vaccines are not excluded in the measure specifications. The numerator codes in the 2019 PREV coding document are all inclusive for the purpose of mapping from the EHR. But if there's medical record documentation showing the patient received an IIV during the appropriate time frame, it is acceptable. Question two is 2019 influenza immunization specs still state that LAIV vaccinations are not eligible for the numerator. The CDC approved the LAIV vaccination for the 2018-2019 flu season. Given the fact that the CD approved this vaccination again, will these immunizations be considered numerator compliant for the 29 reporting year? Um, per CMS direction, if a patient receives the live attenuated influenza vaccine, LAIV, for the 2018-2019 flu season, you should report a denominator exception for system reasons. Next slide, please. Question three is, does there need to be documentation that the patient met the denominator exception criteria during the flu season, um, being August 1st, 2018 through March 31st, 2019? The answer is for 2019, the documentation should be during the measurement period and be specific to the flu season being reported unless it is for documentation of a medical reason for not receiving the influenza vaccine due to an egg allergy. A documented history of an egg allergy in the patient's medical record is acceptable for this exception. Um, however, we want to let you know that beginning in 2020, documentation of the egg allergy must be during the measurement period and be specific to the flu season being reported to ensure that the allergy is still active. So a documented history of an egg allergy in the medical record will no longer be accepted. This guidance aligns with the measure steward's intent for using the denominator exception for medical reason. So we did receive clarification from them uh, for 2020. Next slide, please. These questions are for the PREV-10 tobacco use screening and cessation intervention measure. Uh, question one is, does a screening done in the emergency department or inpatient count? The answer is yes. The setting is not specified for this measure. You must use the encounter where the most recent tobacco user status was documented. Question two. What if the patient is screened and is a smoker, but is screened again at a later date and is considered a non-smoker? Um, if there is more than one patient query regarding tobacco use, the most recent during the 24-month look-back period from the measurement period end date, which is January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2019, In this scenario, the patient would be considered a non-smoker for the purposes of the measure. Question three, is there a specific length of time that a patient has to be a non-smoker for them to be considered not a current tobacco user? No, there is no specific length of time that must pass after a patient ceases using tobacco in which they may be considered a non-smoker. Next slide, please. Question four, what medications are acceptable for tobacco cessation? The numerator drug codes in the 2019 PREV coding document may be referenced for a listing of appropriate medications. These codes are all inclusive for the purpose of EHR mapping. However, medical record documentation can be used if the patient meets the intent measure. Both the brand name and the generic versions of the drugs in the coding document are acceptable. Question five, who is able to complete the cessation intervention within our organization? 
For example, can a medical assistant provide counseling to the patient or does it need to be a physician? Cessation counseling can be provided by anyone your organization considers qualified and for whom the eligible clinician or group takes responsibility for. Uh, per the measure specifications, in order to promote a team-based approach to patient care, the tobacco cessation intervention can be performed by another healthcare provider. Therefore, the tobacco use screening and tobacco cessation intervention do not need to be performed by the same provider or clinician. Thank you very much, and I will turn it back over to Lisa Marie Gomez with CMS. Thanks, Angie. Um, so, we'll, um, so the next few slides will outline the available CMS web interface resources. So next slide. So right now we're on slide 19. So please note that 2019 materials providing information on the MIPS quality performance category are available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library. We encourage reviewing these resources if you have any questions on quality requirements and measures. We'll continue to communicate any future postings and upcoming support calls. Next slide, please. The QPP webinar library also contains recordings, slides, and transcripts for past QPP webinars, including the recent 2019 CMS Web Interface user demonstration held in November and the CMS Web Interface kickoff call held in last December, and also last week's support call. Please note, um, that it does take about one to two weeks to post the presentation to the library following a webinar. So I just want to highlight that, you know, as we have these support calls, please check regularly so that you can see um, which ones are posted. So if you need to go back to any information that we discussed in previous slide decks, you'll have access to that information. Additionally, the help and support page on the QPP website contains links to materials such as videos, webinars, and online courses as well as other items to help with reporting and development. Next slide, please. This slide contains links to resources available for the Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs and the Next Generation ACO model. We encourage you to review the materials available here and sign up to each newsletter for more information. Next slide, please. If you need additional assistance, please refer to the contact information listed on this slide. Next slide. Now, just before we go into the Q&A portion of, of the support call, if you're interested in providing feedback and collaborating with CMS on the Quality Payment Program, we encourage you to participate in our human-centered design efforts. To get involved, please email your name, topic, title, interest, and organization to qppuserresearch at cms.hhs. Gov. Now I will turn this portion of the presentation slash support call to Michaela to begin the Q&A session. Great. Thank you, Lisa Marie. So now we will begin the question and answer portion of the webinar. So please do submit your questions via the questions tab on your screen, or you may raise your hand for a phone question and we will unmute your line. Um, so our first chat question is on PREV5. It asks, if a patient had a unilateral mastectomy and therefore a unilateral mammogram, would that count or is a bilateral mammogram required? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Yes, that would be acceptable as long as there's medical record documentation that the patient had a unilateral mastectomy and a mammogram of the remaining breast. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. So this next question is on PREV10. Is lung cancer an exception for why no screening was done? Hi, this is Jamie with PIMS. Thanks for the question. Um, went ahead and took a look at the um, specifications, and it indicates for denominator exception of medical reason that um, the patient would have to have a limited life expectancy or other medical reason. So I went ahead and pulled up the coding document that is associated with PREV10, and it looks like the codes are lending themselves to that terminal illness. So therefore, my response will be um, maybe take another look at that medical chart and see if that patient with lung cancer is a terminal patient in order to meet the denominator exception. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next question says, for the diabetes measure, it states greater than 9. So A1Cs of 9 or less would not meet this measure, correct? A1Cs 9.1 and greater would meet the measure? This is Deb from the PIMS team, and, and that is a correct interpretation of DM2 as shown on page 5 of the specification. Just please note that this measure is considered an inverse measure, so actually the lower your performance, the better you have done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will take a phone question. So, uh, Jason Shropshire, I have unmuted your line. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I was hoping to get clarification regarding the PREV-12 measure today. I didn't seem, see anything about this. So what we need clarification on is regarding the screening portion when a, P, a patient scores a PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 of zero, does the provider have to review anything to satisfy the screening portion? Last year we were told, we were told they did not. This year, there seems to be confusion on whether or not scores of zero have to be, quote, unquote, interpreted by the provider. Please clarify. Katie, would you be able to address that question? I, Lisa Marie, this from, is, go ahead, Katie. Katie, are you there? You may be on here. Yeah, Lisa Marie, this is Deb. I think we need to go back and look at those slides. And Jason, I know that you need clarification here. We just want to make sure that we um, provide an absolute accurate answer for 2019 as we know that there's some different things going on for 2019 and 2020. So we will um, ensure that we can get you an answer today on this call if at all possible. Okay, that would be great because we've deliberately been waiting to run those reports. We're in a, a holding pattern as I'm sure other people are until we get that clarification. Yes, sir. Completely understand, and, and I think we're going to be able to answer it, but we just, uh, I hope you understand, we want to make sure that we don't come out and say something that, that we should not. So we're going to do a quick double check, take some of the other answers, and see if we can get you that answer today. Great. Thank you. All right. So our next chat question is on PREV 13. Could the diagnosis of hyperlipidemia be used in lieu of pure or familial hypercholesterolemia? And this is Deb again. And for PREV 13, if you were to look at page 7 of the post of specification, it does define the denominator population for risk category 2. Um, and so you would have to have what is considered an active diagnosis of familial or pure hypercholesterolemia. Um, or have been previously diagnosed with one of those two conditions. So simply having um, the, the diagnosis, of you, as you indicated, would not be sufficient to confirm diagnosis for risk population two. Thank you. All right, thank you. Our next question is on HTN2. Can we use a blood pressure reading taken from the ED setting? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So while the intent of the measure is to be outpatient, blood pressure readings from any clinical setting are acceptable when reporting the numerator. So it would be appropriate to move to the next most recent blood pressure if the most recent blood pressure from an ED or inpatient setting is not within normal parameters. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we'll take another phone question. Um, so, Brandy Dunn, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, and Brandy Dunn, are you there? We've unmuted your line. Um, you may ask your question. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay, for Prev 12, any score above a zero, we will um, initiate the remaining questions of the THQ-9, and it's considered positive, and we'll do a plan. Do the words positive, does the words positive have to be written out anywhere in the chart? Or can we just go with the assumption that anything above a zero, we will continue with the questions for the PHQ-9? So unfortunately, this is the same um, kind of thing we need to look into as uh, the question that Jason asked on Prev 12. We need to confirm um, how exactly what we can do with Prev 12 outside of scoring. So if you don't mind, um, I, I know it's a lot to ask, but if you could just hold that question, we're going to continue to research and see if we can get you an answer um, still on this call. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so our next chat question, um, this person's just asking if, uh, Lisa Marie, if you could repeat um, that last comment you had on Prev 12 um, that was mentioned on slide 10 but is not on the slides. Sure. So I believe that the individual is probably wanting me to repeat information relative to, to what types of clinical actions would be acceptable for reporting. So as I noted for the 2019 reporting, report reporting, so CMS, we will accept any of the follow-up plan actions previously allowed in the 2018 measure specifications, which includes repeat screening after an initial positive screen. Great, thank you. So our next question is on the HTN measure. Are the codes listed on the denominator code list the only codes that are counted? Um, and this person notes that they have a PT that was coded for essential HTN, resolved in 2018, and coded with a different code that's not part of the HTN denominator list. Would this patient be not confirmed diagnosis? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So for this measure, um, to confirm the patient in the denominator, you should first ensure that their diagnosis truly did not end prior to the measurement period. Um, for purposes of the mapping to an EHR, the codes are considered all-inclusive, but if you're not mapping and you have medical record documentation that supports an appropriate diagnosis of essential hypertension within the first six months of the measurement period or any time after, and again, does not resolve before the start of the measurement period, you can go ahead and use that documentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on with another phone question. So, Meredith Titterington, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Um, so my question is about PREV-12. In previous years, if a patient had uh, done a PHQ-2 and that was positive, you could screen for, you could further evaluate their depression using a, an additional screening tool. Is that still the case, like a positive PHQ and then doing a PHQ-9 and it's negative? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So as um, Lisa Marie just mentioned, um, we are going to go ahead and accept um, what was previously allowed for 2018 and 2019. So for 2019, um, we will allow any follow-up depression screen after a positive PHQ-2. Thank Great, you. thank you. Great. So our next chat question is asking if the updated measure specifications have been released on the QPP resource library. 
Hi, this is Jamie with the PINs team. Um, the most current web interface specifications are located on the QPP resource library page. Um, if this question is in relation to the 2020 specifications, those two are also available out on that resource page. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so our next question um, asks, can tobacco counseling occur any time during the 24-month look-back period? Hi, this is Jamie with the PINS team. Um, yes, indeed, uh, the tobacco cessation counseling can occur 24 months um, as a look-back. That is true. Thank you. Great, thank you. And so we'll take another phone question at this time. Uh, so Darren Barnes, I've unmuted your line. If you still have a question, you may go ahead. This question is actually about the web interface uh, reporting tool. I was looking through it today, and on PREV, 12, PREV 13, when we're try trying to enter my information, if I have a denominator exclusion, such as end-stage renal disease, you know, when you go to the first question, does the patient have a diagnosis of atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease, and the drop-down selections, and if I select denominator exclusions, oh no, denominator exclusion, in previous years, I'm pretty sure it grayed out everything after that. You didn't have to continue and answer all the questions. It looks like this year those questions are still open. Do I have to, if I have an exclusion, a major exclusion, do I have to continue to answer all the questions across the, across the board there? Aslan, would your team be able to address that question? Um, could you please repeat the question? I have 13. If I have a denominator exclusion, uh, under the first question of asking if they have ASCVD, and I enter no denominator exclusion because they have end-stage renal disease, in previous years, I'm pretty sure all the other questions about LDL greater than 90, diabetes, all of that was grayed out because you have a denominator exclusion. This year, it looks like all of those remain open. Do I have to, con if I have a denominator exclusion, do I have to continue to enter information in all of those other columns, even though the whole patient would be excluded? Hey, this is Laura with the Web Interface product team. Um, no, the denominator exclusion should automatically skip your patient. Um, if you are running into this issue, you could submit a help desk ticket for us with a screenshot of what you're seeing so we can look into it further. Okay, I just know they're not grayed out this year and last year I believe they were, so, okay. Yes, thank and this you. Is good. This is Deb from the PIMS team. Just, I don't know that this will make a big difference, but um, it's, it's just the verbiage. The ESRD is considered a denominator exception, which would be treated differently than a denominator exclusion. So just keep that in mind um, as you're looking at the exclusions versus the exceptions. You're right, I, I apologize for my miswording. So I see nowhere there's a drop down to, to claim an, ex, an exception. I'm either missing it or I'm not, I just don't see it. Right, and I think that has to do with the way that those two different things work. With the exclusion, that patient just is not eligible for the measure as a whole, and they would be skipped and replaced. When you select an exception, it is always possible that the quality action has been met. Um, so there could be the fact that you have a patient who uh, is, ESRD, but for whatever reason, their clinician has determined that they should still be receiving a statin, and so that would be a performance met. Um, so it could be that you have to work your way all the way through that specification, through those risk categories, in order to determine um, at that point if you should select the exception. Again, working different than the exclusion does. And, and I'm only speaking from the measure perspective, not from the tool. So, you know, what, what you received from the previous um, uh, panelist would, would be accurate for the tool. Um, and so if you need to send something in for them to look at, I would do that. I just wanted to give that from the, the measure perspective. I appreciate it. And I see that now as I look across. Thank you. Great. So our next chat question asks, what is a positive PHQ-2? 
Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So a positive PHQ2 would be a PHQ2 um, score where the patient was identified as positive for depression. The measure specifications don't include instructions on how to determine whether a standardized screening is positive or negative. For that, you would need to refer to the specific tool in use. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question says, for PrEP 6, if the patient received an FOBT exam within the measurement period done in the office setting, but wasn't completed via digital rectal exam, would that satisfy the measure? Um, and they're asking to please clarify that. Hi, this is Angie with PIMS. Um, yes, as long as the FOBT is not collected via digital rectal exam, it would count. Samples collected via DRE, regardless of setting, are not approved for the measure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next chat question asks about the flu vaccine. Um, they say we have information entered into the field that were not answered yet. Was this pre-populated by CMS as it was in previous years? This is Kristen, um, and yes, PREP7 is the only instance where numerator-specific data are pre-populated, um, but just note that the data is not pre-populated for all beneficiaries ranked in PREP7, but only those where an immunization could be found in the claims data. Thank you. And we will take another phone question at this time. So, Martin Gens, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, I was wondering if somebody could please clarify uh, which measures this year are pay for reporting. Hi, this is Jamie with PIMS. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, PREV 10 and PREV 12 are going to be for the ACO side pay for reporting and then excluded from scoring on the MIP side. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, others are thinking the way that I am. So CMS, does that uh, ring true with you? Hi, Jamie. Yes, you're correct that for PREV 10 and PREV 12 for, for, for performance year 2019, those two measures are pay, re pay for reporting for the Medicare Shared, Shared, Shared Savings Program and the next-gen ACO model and excluded from MIPS for scoring purposes. So, yes, this is, you are Fiona, from the, this is Fiona from the Shared Savings Program. Um, are you um, asking as an ACO because there are other measures as well within the ACO program that are pay for reporting for 2019? Um, yeah, I'm MH1, MH1 and the statin measure are both pay for reporting as well. They're pay for reporting all years under the Shared Savings Program, along with the other two measures that were mentioned. Um, and RTI, did I miss any other measures that are pay for reporting for um, the Shared Savings Program for 2019? No, I think you covered it, Fiona. Okay. You said MH1 and what else? The statin measure, which is PREV 13, I believe, if so somebody could correct me on that That's one. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, and it's ACO 42 yeah. for a shared Thank savings you. program. Are you a, uh, as an ACO, are you a um, an ACO in your first performance year of your first agreement? Or no, we actually, ACO? We, uh, ACO and we have five ACOs under us this year. Is this your no. first? Is this your first performance year of your first agreement seventh, period? No. Okay, then so those are the only year. measures that will be so those are the only measures that will be paid for reporting for you for 2019. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Great, thank you. So our next chat question says for the diabetes measure, if the physician's note says that recent A1C is 6.4 according to the patient, but there's no date for the A1C, can we take it? And this is Deb. No, you would not be able to take that value because you need to be able to confirm that the A1C is 
an A1C that occurred during the measurement period. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next chat question is on PREV 10. If the medical record has an office note including social HO tobacco use never reviewed, does the record quality or qualify the patient for the measure? Hi, this is Jamie with PENS. Thanks for asking this question. Just taking a look at it, looking at the measure specification, and I'm, I will be honest with you, I'm not sure what um, never reviewed, what that really means within your system. Um, and I, I believe you're trying to confirm this patient based on that screening as, aspect of whether or not they've been screened for tobacco. So um, just a couple thoughts here. Either try to clarify the question within the cue box or go ahead and submit a question to ServiceNow, and we'll be able to, you know, get the proper response that you need to um, continue with this patient for abstraction. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, our next question asks, what exactly does re-screening mean as part of a follow-up for PREV-12? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So in previous years, um, it was acceptable to conduct another standardized depression screen after receiving a positive standardized depression screen. So that initial screen followed by an additional screening. Um, in 2019, there were some coding changes made that um, removed the associated follow-up screening. Um, however, CMS has um, given guidance that for 2019, um, they will allow and accept any follow-up actions previously allowed in the 2018 measure specifications. So a repeat screen or an additional standardized depression screening tool after an initial positive screen will be accepted for 2019 reporting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so for this next question, this person's looking for some clarification on tobacco cessation counseling. And they note that in the past, the counseling, um, I'm sorry, I just lost this question. Um, in the past, the counseling had to be completed by an eligible licensed clinician. And based on today's presentation, is it appropriate for a medical assistant to offer the cessation counseling at the time a patient is screened as a tobacco user? Hi, this is Jamie with the PIMS team, and you got me scrolling through the specification right now. I wasn't quite ready for you, but that's okay. <laughs> I know within the guidance of the um, documentation within that specification, it does speak to um, this measure having a clinical team approach. Um, in that instance, uh, they do allow for other medical clinicians to go ahead and do that um, tobacco screening and that cessation. So in this instance, that would be appropriate. Thanks for the question. Thank you. All right, we'll take another phone question at this time. So, uh, Drew White, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead with your question. My question is, once the minimum is met for each measure, and let's take example, the fall risk assessment, once the minimum is met, is it true that each patient that is met let's say it's met at patient number 350, that every patient after there, that where the patient is compliant, where the measure has been met, that it will add to your score. And then once you reach patients who are not compliant, that that will take away from your score. In other words, if you, if you, met the fall measure at number 350 and the next five patients are compliant, then you would continue to report the next five patients. Is that correct? Hi. Um, once you meet the minimum reporting requirement, which is 248 beneficiaries, you will be, um, you will finish reporting for that measure if you skip a, a patient uh, ranked within the minimum 248, that patient will be skipped, and then you will need to move on to the next ranked beneficiary, ranked number 249, and report on that beneficiary to complete your 
uh, minimum reporting requirement. Uh, once you meet your minimum reporting requirement, you are not required to complete any of the beneficiaries in the oversample. However, if you choose to, you can complete the beneficiaries in the oversample, and uh, the, the beneficiaries in the oversample, if completed, will impact your score. Hope this answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. So going to our next chat question. Uh, just one moment while I pull this next one up. Um, so this next one's on PREV 5 and PREV 6, and the person would like to confirm how patient denial should be documented within the interface. Is written confirmation of a denial numerator compliant? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, there are no denominator exceptions for patient refusal for the breast cancer or the colorectal cancer screening measures. So you would select no when reporting the numerator for those. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this next question is for PREV 12. Can we use only PHQ-9 as a screening tool? Hi, this is Katie. So for PREV 12, um, PHQ-9 is not the only screening tool available. Um, there's a list of appropriate screening tools for that um, standardized depression screening that starts on page 5 of the 2019 CMS Web Interface Measure Specification. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then I do want to revisit one question. Um, this person said they uh, didn't quite understand the response. So back to this question on the HTN measure. Are the codes listed on the denominator code list the only codes that are counted? I have a patient that was coded for essential HTN, resolved in 2018, and coded with a different code that is not on the HTN denominator list. Would this patient be not confirmed? diagnosis? So this is Katie again. Um, this question has many facets and if this response does not um, cover the whole gambit, I would definitely encourage um, the submitter to send in their question to qpp at cms.hhs.gov. But for purposes of denominator confirmation, the patient has to have a documented diagnosis of essential hypertension within the first six months of the measurement period or any time prior to the measurement period. But that diagnosis cannot end before the start of the measurement period. So the codes that are listed in the coding document are considered all-inclusive for purposes of mapping to an EHR. However, if you you have medical record documentation of the appropriate diagnosis and that it is active within the first six months or any time prior to the measurement period and has not ended, you can use that documentation and confirm that diagnosis for the measure. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Katie. So this next question is on the PREV-10 numerator drug codes. Will another strength or form of that drug listed be accepted? For example, nortiptyline 10 milligram oral tablet. Yeah, that's a tongue twister. That was good. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this question. Question. This is Jamie with PIMS. Um, yeah, that's acceptable. We'll just ensure that you have the documentation within the patient's medical record. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, we'll take another phone question at this time. So. Morgan Keene, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead with your question. Um, hey, hey. Um, I, my question is regarding PREV 13. Um, we're working through, you know, the different risk category populations, and we notice, um, obviously, it's quicker for us to find diabetes first. So we wanted to understand, is it okay if we jump to risk population number three first to address um, the question. 
this is Deb from the PIMS team, and I'll answer from the perspective of the measure, and I don't know if anyone else on the, the call, any of the other panelists would have additional information that, that they would like to share, but the way we understand this measure from the measure steward is that you should be working through the risk categories in order that they have been included in the specification. So you really should be going through the risk categories, um, starting with risk category one. Um, again, I don't know if any other panelists on the call have additional information. I mean, maybe there's a way in the tool that it's working differently. So keep in mind that this is strictly from the measure perspective. Hi, this is Laura from the product team as well. And yeah, you, you'll you need to answer the questions in order. Um, it's kind of hard with the conditional formatting that we have with our questions to, to answer that out of order. Okay, thank you. So our next question is asking, is there somewhere where I can find any additional information on the PREV 12 changes and or clarifications? Hi, this is Jamie with PIMS. Um, this is a great question and I'm going to look to um, maybe CMS to beef up my answer a little bit. Um, We'll go ahead and um, look into potentially providing more information to support um, submission of this measure um, in regards to getting you the answers that you need, as Deb indicated earlier on the call. Um, any questions that you do have subsequent from the information received today, I just I would um, you know kindly ask you to continue to submit your service now uh, inquiries, and we can go ahead and get those answered and um, provide as much detail as possible on how to get this submitted. Uh, Lisa Bree or any others, any additional information you would provide in regards to this topic? So, no, I think, Kimmy, I think you answered it. And I think, um, I know we're getting, I just also want to know, I know we're getting like a lot of questions about this. And, um, and this, I think, is a, a large topic, particularly because we've been holding off on discussing this. But as we get to these questions, we are trying to answer as much as we can and provide you with um, the information to help you build a report. Um, so, so I don't have anything further to add, but I think right now um, we'll continue to address your questions as they come in. And, and also, just so you know, please submit your questions also via the um, Quality Payment Program Service Center, and we can also address your questions there. Um, and as you know, we have a support call next week, so please continue to submit your questions during that time. Um, and as we continue to go through the various dynamics with these questions that we have through today, we will also continue to address those hopefully like next week in our frequently asked questions session of the portion of our presentations for next week. Great, thank you. So this next question is on HTN. If the patient's recent blood pressure reading is high at the ED visit, but the office visit blood pressure reading is normal prior to the ED visit. Which one can we take? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, in this instance, if the most recent blood pressure from an ED or inpatient setting is not within normal parameters, it would be appropriate to move to the next most recent. So again, Although this measure is intended to be outpatient, those blood pressure readings from other clinical settings can be used, but if they are, excuse me, not within normal parameters in this instance, it would be acceptable to move to the next most recent. And to reiterate, that's only for ED or inpatient settings. Any outpatient settings, um, you would need to use the most recent blood pressure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have time for one more question. So our last question is on the PREV-7 influenza measure. If we see our patient had the vaccine administered via our state's immunization registry, but we do not have documentation in our EHR, would we count this patient as compliance? And this is Deb. As long as... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Deb. Go. 
as long as you can find and and ha you have medical record documentation that the influenza um, measure has been met, you can certainly use it. Um, just be aware to, you know, in the event of an audit, you would have to be able to show documentation that supports what you've reported. So you would want to be able to show that the patient received an influenza vaccination during the appropriate time period um, in order to show that the measure's been met. Great, thank you. So that is all the time that we have for the Q&A today. So uh, as Lisa Marie said, of course, we will have our next weekly support call next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and those will go on weekly until March 25th. Um, so thank you all for joining, and I'll pass it back to Lisa Marie for our final closing. Thank you, Michaela. So I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, the slide deck, the recording, and the transcript from today's call will be available on the QPP webinar library in the next two weeks. So it doesn't take about two weeks for us to be able to post these materials. So just keep an eye out for those um, every two weeks once the presentation is concluded. Um, as Michaela noted, our next support call is next week from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topics that we will recover next week will be the high priority and end-to-end -end bonus points and frequently asked measure questions regarding fine measures, which are CARE 2, MH1, PREV 5, PREV 6, PREV 12, and PREV 13. We hope you all can join us. Thank you again, and have a good day.